Hack the Entrepreneur is part of Rainmaker FM, the digital business podcast network. Find more great shows and education at rainmaker.fm. Hack the Entrepreneur is supported by City Cards with Android Pay. Listening on your phone? Now you can pay while you listen using the same device. Just tap and go. Download the Android Pay app on Google Play or visit city.com slash Android Pay to get started. Android Pay is available for eligible city consumer credit and debit cards. Welcome to Hack the Entrepreneur, the show which reveals the fears, habits, and inner battles behind big name entrepreneurs and those on their way to joining them. Now here is your host, John Naster. Entrepreneur, I'm so glad you decided to join me today. I'm your host, John Naster but you can call me Johnny. Today's guest is an artist, musician, and entrepreneur who made his first record when he was 12, began playing in clubs when he was 14, and started his own music publishing company at 18. My guest's passion for music and technology led him to found music licensing firm Rumblefish in his college dorm room. The company quickly achieved the industry's first podcast license, fully automated online music licensing store, and inked a groundbreaking micro-licensing deal with YouTube. Rumblefish became the largest music licensing company for independent music in the world and was acquired in 2014 by a private equity firm. My guest was kept on as president and CEO to lead it into the next phase of growth. He is a devoted member of the entrepreneurial and creative communities in the Pacific Northwest. As the co-founder of popular guitar pedal company Spaceman, startup accelerator Starve Ups, and TEDx Portland. Now, let's hack Paul Anthony Traiano. Hack the Entrepreneur is sponsored by City Cards with Android Pay. How cool is it that we live in a world where you can use the same device to listen to Hack the Entrepreneur and buy your morning coffee, groceries, and more? And did I mention that it's a super fast way to pay? Just use your City Card with Android Pay at the register. Get in. Get it get going. Download the Android Pay app on Google Play or visit city.com slash Android Pay to get started. Android Pay is available for eligible city consumer credit and debit cards. Welcome back to Hack the Entrepreneur. Today we have a very special guest. Paul, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Oh, it's all my pleasure, Paul. All my pleasure. Paul, let's jump straight into this first question. Paul, as an entrepreneur, can you tell me what is the one thing that you do that you feel has been the biggest contributor to your successes so far? Not giving up. It's really easy to to kind of give in to the various pressures when you're an entrepreneur in any venture. You know, there's family pressures, economic pressures, you know, business model pressures of financing from investors or not getting finance from investors, you name it. I think perseverance is your greatest ally, especially in the early days, because I think you're a fool as an entrepreneur to assume that you have it all figured out when you start, because your business plan is guaranteed to cost three times as much as you thought it would and take five times as long. But above and beyond that, if you don't have perseverance in your corner, you're just going to, you're not going to make it. So I think the most important thing that I've done as an entrepreneur, if I just had to pick one thing, is it's definitely that, just staying in the game. Did you always have that in you, that idea of just, I just got to put my head down and just keep going? Or is this something you that's evolved within you? I'm really stubborn. So <laughs> I've, always, <laughs> I've always been stubborn. And I think I just learned as I got older to take that negative element of my personality and capitalize on it as an entrepreneur. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. I like that. All right. There seems to be a time in every entrepreneur's life when they realize one of two things. Either they have this calling to make something big and make a difference in the world, or what seems to mostly be the case is they simply cannot work for somebody else. Paul, can you tell me which side of the fence you fall on and when you discovered this about yourself? Well, it's that's an interesting way to put it. I never thought of it as an either or, but... I've been fired from every job I've ever had before Rumblefish. 
So maybe that answers the question. Yeah, it might. <laughs> <laughs> simply cannot stay employed anywhere else. I'm unemployable. Therefore, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> no, I flip burgers. I manage apartment complexes. I brought audiovisual equipment to classrooms at the University of Oregon. But what always happened in those situations was, I remember one time that really stood out. My manager was watching me when I was washing the side of a building that I was the assistant manager for at the University of Oregon. And I got a call from a radio station and they said, hey, Sarah McLaughlin's in town. We need someone to come and produce some acoustic singles. And she had just won a Grammy. And they said, can you come? I said, sure, when? They said, right now. So I literally dropped the brush I was scrubbing <laughs> the building with, got in my car and drove away with my manager staring at me like, what does this guy think he's doing? So there's like a hundred versions of that, which led to my imminent un termination and all my different jobs. So I guess I was just always drawn to music and art and that's just kind of how it turned out for me. So was it, was it worth it for the Sarah McLaughlin session? It was totally worth it. It was yes. totally, that's totally the answer worth I wanted. <laughs> it. It, they were all worth it. It was worth getting fired by Donna from Hammy's because I left my burger flipping station to do this music thing and it was it was all worth it you rarely regret the things that you do it seems you always regret the things you don't do so that's it right there i regret a lot of things i've done like right after I oh really <laughs> but you can't hold on to it right you got to move forward and learn from it right you make the best of it exactly but if you were still sitting here talking being like i could have produced sarah mclaughlin that one time but i just i kept painting <laughs> that, that wouldn't have been cool <laughs> yeah that that wouldn't have made the, the bar talk conversation, I guess. Yeah, totally. Exactly. And so you're a terrible employee. How does this work for you now being a boss and having employees? Is there anything that you've taken from what you totally just couldn't work with or didn't like as being an employee that you've decided to do differently now that you're the one in charge? Yeah, good question. So I realized that I was a terrible employee because I always had the wrong job. And it's not that I'm just a, you know, a terrible employee across the board. I think entrepreneurs are terrible employees for companies when they're punching the clock or they don't feel like they're making a difference in the world or they just see this problem that needs to be solved. No one's solving it or the people who are solving it are solving it either ineffectively or too slow or thinking small. So I figured out that actually I'm, I am a really great employee. And oddly enough, now that Rumblefish was acquired, I actually am an employee of the organization. But you know, once you're doing what you feel like you've, you're meant to do, then every, it's not a job. It's just you're, it feels like you know, you're painting a picture that only you can see the entire picture laid out on the full canvas. And you're forced to go about it you know, one pixel at a time. And so it doesn't feel like a job that way. It feels more like I get, I have the privilege of coordinating a group of incredible people to paint this picture and achieve that objective. And for me, that's always been related to music and artists and helping artists get compensated for their work and helping creators use music to make better movies or videos or that type of thing. So, wow. And so you're, you are an employee now, and you didn't have the right job. I like that. Yeah. And now you've sort of. So, is there a chance that you could have found the right job before, and then Rumblefish would never exist because if you didn't come up with it, though? No. Isn't that interesting? No. <laughs> that is. It helps a lot of people. Mister. No. The uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the right job for me was I learned about myself as an entrepreneur that I'm a builder, that I'm happy when I'm building. I was the president of my grade school. I was the president of my fraternity. I, you know, I run my Burning Man camp. I like to build stuff and group people together and take an idea and make it into reality. So the right job for me is to build stuff. And that could be a music company. It could be a, it could be a camp. It could be whatever. But that, that's the role that I'm comfortable in. And the more ambitious the idea and the more it's centralized around art and music, the more excited about it I get. So that, that's how I think of it at least. Nice. So you're a builder and your one thing is, is perseverance and not giving up. 
So all the experts now talk about the 80-20 rule in business and in life in general. Uh, Do 20% and you're going to get 80% of the results. Do what you're good at. Delegate the rest. Paul, can you tell me something in your business that you are absolutely not good at? Yeah, there's, I mean, where do I begin? (laughs) (laughs) This has been from when you conceive the business until when, you know, any number of milestones down the road. It's a, a constant process of letting go of things that you're bad at and also things that you're good at because you find people who are great at it. And my, I always feel like the ultimate success of an entrepreneur really is to surround themselves with people who are great at what they're bad at. I say that a lot. And that's what you're constantly searching for. So things that I'm bad at, I'm not a great operations person. I'm not an engineer. I don't understand code. I don't understand high finance. I understand most finance. You know, a lot of things that have to do with HR and, you know, the the nuts and bolts of, in essence, the trains running on time are not my strength as as an operator. My strength is building the new product, sales, and seeing where the market's going to be in five, six, seven years, and most of the time being correct. Those are my strengths and, and building a culture. I'm good at building culture. But all the other things you need to learn from hiring great people that you can surround yourself with, you turn them loose and you, you watch and learn from them. And do you remember with Rumblefish, the first employees or things that you got to, people you got to hire? Yeah, Tanya Ortiz was our first employee. Nice. And what did she do? Uh, like, I just want to know, what's the first thing that you were like, okay, this, we have to get somebody else to do this because I can't do this. <laughs> That's a good question. So... I wish it was that simple. We had an intern army. I started the company in my dorm room at the University of Oregon. So oh, wow. our first several years, I had like 10 to 15 interns that were earning four credits that were working for Rumblefish for free. And so they did all sorts of things. They did anything that needed to get done. And it could have been you know, helping with scores. It could have been finding bands that we were placing in films. It could have been literally anything. So we started with an intern army. And then shortly thereafter, the people that I started to hire to help out were managing the catalog. They were a bookkeeper to help with the financials, you know, different, you know, anything in the category that I'm bad at, which I generally say is keeping the trains running on time and being operationally like excellent. I'm good at growing, not at managing. So. And was it your idea to get this intern army? Oh yeah, that's brilliant. That's amazing. Well, I went to I went to the Career Development Center at the University of Oregon and sat down with them as well. I, I put my name is Paul Anthony Troiano, but a lot of people call me Paul Anthony. And so when I sat down with them to ask them questions as Paul Anthony, the owner of this business, they didn't understand that I wasn't a student. And so they started telling me, "Oh, how many interns do you need?" and you know, they can get four credits. And if you put a program together, we can staff it up. And I was like, well, how many can I get? As many as you need. So I was like, wow, free labor. Great. So (laughs) I had a large intern army and I may have also been an intern for Rumblefish. (laughs) You're not sure. Gotten eight credits, but you know, whatever. (laughs) Wow. So you are, you're a builder. You just, you didn't, Look at this idea of wanting to start Rumblefish and be like, I just, I don't have money to hire employees. I don't have people that you just figured out a way to do it. Yeah, that's the perseverance part, right? If you really want to do it, you can do it. We just got to figure out how, how to make it happen. Okay. And so when you are, I understand you just have to make things happen, but as you're making these things happen, as you grew it from an intern army to a company that later got acquired, there's probably things that went wrong. So, cause as human beings, and then that just gets pulled over to when you turn into an entrepreneur as well. One of our greatest struggles, it seems, is the fear of being wrong and just making a mistake. Paul, could you sort of walk us through how to be wrong in something that you thought was the right decision in your business? You push the business in that direction and then the feedback comes from either the market or somewhere else. It says, no, Paul, you're totally, this isn't right. Yeah, that's it. How do you get over that and work on? So I guess early on, I was afraid of failing. 
and was desperate to have any sort of success. So small successes were very intoxicating, right? Because you're like, oh, wow, this some one person likes this idea and I got one client. It's So I think that small successes are very distracting. If you want the big success and you're convinced that it's the right answer, then failure really is a prerequisite for success, right? You're going to fail. Like, how do you ride a bike the first time perfectly? It just doesn't happen, right? So mm-hmm. I think over the years, I changed my philosophy on failure to wanting to fail fast and fail a lot to improve, to gain that experience, to improve quickly, to be successful. So it's, so we really have a thoughts here around that. Rumble Fish is like, fail fast, you know, go faster. It's, if you fail fast, you can, you can learn and improve. And really embrace that. And if you empower your team, especially to be brave and embrace failure so that that's a step towards success, then they'll be trust their convictions and execute on what they are passionate about. And many times that's the right answer anyways, and you don't fail. But I guess our our mindset on failure, mine mine specifically over the years has has really flip-flopped because if you you only go where you get yeses and you run from failure, then you're going to build somebody else's business. You know, what everyone else said yes to, which wasn't probably your idea. True. Fail fast, go faster. So since your idea of failure has sort of changed or evolved over time, do you think that, say, like, I almost think of it as like a muscle, like the more you get into things and the more you make mistakes, the easier they are to deal with? Yeah. Like today, one of the businesses I'm involved in, we were going over some pretty in-depth financials. And if I rewind the clock on myself like seven years, six, seven years, I was taken aside after a board meeting by my mentor. And he literally told me, if you don't figure out how financials work, we're just going to, you know, we're all going to leave because you don't get it, man. And you're a drummer that went to music school, that kind of went to business school after that, that got expelled from college that doesn't understand financials. So you need to like study up, man. (laughs) So it's, you know, I, so I did. And, you know, to put a lot of time, effort and energy into it. And now I really understand that landscape, not as well as a CPA or a, a great CFO or anything, but you know, you learn those things by failing fast. So my, my tactic was to go back to the board after that and say, just put my hand up and say, hi, I'm Paul. I'm bad at financials. I need help. And can you all help me? And then what that set, the path that sent me down was learning from these incredible entrepreneurs who are on my board who ran you know, multi-billion dollar businesses, how they look at a P&L, how they think about finance, how they dissect financials in their companies. And it was an incredible experience. So I think you just got to, you're right, it's just like a muscle you got to dig in and, you know, tackle those things. So there's something there I want to touch on, but I can't gloss over the fact that you're a drummer. (laughs) Yeah. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah. I play a a purple DW five piece kit with those and (laughs) cymbals. Nice. I play a black pearl with Sabian cymbals. Sabian. Okay. I'll forgive you. I'm Canadian. I'm Canadian. It's a Canadian symbol. Come on. Okay. That's cool. (laughs) But I wonder just with this financials thing, I could imagine like you come from arts, you come from music, and there's a lot of people that struggle with not just the financials, but even thinking that that is necessary, that the art should rule the business and then their businesses never work. Was there an internal struggle at all when your mentor was like, come on, man, you got to learn financials if you want to do this? Were you like, no, I don't. I don't want to get into that part of it. Yeah. I guess I've been immune to that gene that lots of artists have about having regret for charging for art. Because to me, it's very simple. There's a yin-yang relationship with art and commerce. And I feel like the role that Rumblefish has played that's resulted in you know, many, many millions of dollars in royalties for artists is we translate art and commerce to each other. We help the artists understand the value of income. And 
we help the businesses and the video creators that want to use music, the value of paying for it and getting them on the same page. It's literally like a translation, like we translate art and business back and forth. And so I've always seen the value of that. I'm very proud of the fact that, and, and, and once you've lived it, like we send, we've been sending royalties to artists for 16 or more years. And you get these phone calls. We, we, give, we pay royalties quarterly. And for the two weeks after we send those royalty checks out, I get calls from bands on tour that fix their van, people that have gotten custody of their kids back because their checks got big enough, you know, new recording consoles, like, you know, paid for the run of the CDs or I guess that's dating us, right? Paid for, <laughs> paid for, paid for the something or other that's not old like a CD. You get these incredible passionate stories and that's when you see the real value of what you're doing. And so that's why I think the financials are totally worth it because you see the value of getting that nailed because that's really what so many artists don't have nailed is how to charge for what they do and how to turn that into more art. You know, we write them checks, they make more art and that's kind of a virtuous cycle. So I knew that that was the payoff. And honestly, the only reason why I hadn't gotten into financials is because I didn't know how. And that board member pulling me aside gave me permission to be vulnerable and say, okay, I guess everyone knows my faking it isn't working at all. (laughs) So, and they're totally down to help me. So take advantage of that. Yeah, I like that. I like that. And translating art and commerce, that's very cool. And the benefit that you are like providing to so many artists is amazing. So that's very cool. We're going to end on something that I'm calling the entrepreneurial gap. So as entrepreneurs, as we build things and you are a builder, you've said, we're always looking ahead one month, three months, six months, a year, three years, 10 years, whatever. As we set goals, we almost get to these goals. We probably don't even hit them. And we've already set five or 10 loftier ones into the future. And we often stop to just stop where we are today, turn around and look at where we've come, what we've come through, what we've learned and what we've built. And I want you right now, you've done, I mean, from the artist side, from the music side, from the production side to the entrepreneurial side, what looks like some really, really, really impressive things, Paul. I would love it if you would stop right now, turn around and look behind you where you've come from, what you've done and tell me how you feel about it. Well, it's very flattering. I appreciate the kind words. How I feel about it. Part of being an entrepreneur, I think, is being able to hold multiple scenarios in your head simultaneously. And for one, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I, I'm very proud of what I've done. And I simultaneously am very unimpressed by it. Because that's what an, being an entrepreneur is all about. Right? It's moving forward. And I'm very grateful for all the people that I've worked with. They've really changed my life and I, I've done my best to help improve theirs. But yeah, it's interesting, right? Like when we sold the company and when, you know, I've co-founded Spaceman and when, you know, you get some crazy guitarist that you'd never imagine would play those pedals to call us and say, come to the concert and hang out because we love your pedals. And you see amazing things that happen along the way. You really do savor those. But they're almost always anticlimactic because of the adrenaline junkiness of being an entrepreneur and saying, yeah, that's awesome. But I, been, I thought of this, I had this idea three years ago and now it finally happened and it's so over, it's so old. Like the, the new thing is the next three year thing, you know? So I'm humbled by my experience that I've had and I can't wait for what's next. You know, I guess that's how I feel about it. Very cool. Very cool. And you're right. We always are. And I think that's why I'm sort of dealing with this and trying to get people's perspective because we are, we, these things, big, amazing things that five years ago, if you knew Rumblefish was going to be acquired, you'd be like shocked probably. But now it's kind of like into the next zone. So thanks, Paul, so much for joining me today. We've talked about your business in passing. Can you specifically tell the listener where they can go find out about you and about your business? Yeah. So if you want to find out about me, Look me up on LinkedIn. I'm under uh, Paul Anthony Troiano. And Rumblefish is, go to rumblefish.com. Rumblefish is music micro licensing business. And we help video creators better tell their stories with music while compensating artists for their art. So 
what that really means is we help video creators put lots of music in their videos that you know would otherwise be really difficult for them to do because music rights are so challenging. So we're removing all the friction between video creators and music rights with all of our licensing expertise and all of our technological expertise. And we've licensed almost 100 million songs into videos. And we do another 150 to 200,000 songs every day. So it's starting to work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we make sure that artists get paid lots of royalties so they can make more music. And if you are a musician or you're a filmmaker, check us out. We'd love to work with you. That's awesome. And if you're a guitar player and want to check out the pedals. Yeah, if you play guitar bass man effects. and you play bass and you want a secret weapon that melts faces, then go to Space Man Effects and uh, find something there. All of our pedals are limited edition. So anything that you get will run out and you won't see everybody else with it on your pedal board. So it's a pretty, pretty awesome product. And they sell out quick when we release them. They're kind of, they sell like concert tickets less than pedals. So you got to get on them and pick out the one you like. And they're also on eBay as well. Lots of people resell them. And Rumblefish is at rumblefish.com. Very cool. So rumblefish.com, Paul on LinkedIn, and spacemanfx.com. I will link to all three of those in the show notes so they're easy for you to find. Please track down Paul. Uh, tell him you heard him. And uh, yeah, just have a conversation with him on LinkedIn. Paul, thank you so much again for joining me. I truly, truly appreciate it. Please keep doing what you're doing because it's making a huge impact in the world, especially for artists. And yeah, just keep doing what you're doing, man. It's awesome to watch. Thanks a lot, brother. Appreciate it. Paul, thank you so much for the conversation. That that was was a lot of fun. It was inspiring. And the, the things you've accomplished so far and the things that you are going to accomplish still are really just amazing. And I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to stop by and chat with me. That was, that was a lot of fun. So Paul has, I loved his, the correlation of art and commerce and bringing the two together. I'm, I'm a musician. Uh, well, I'm a drummer <laughs> and it's, it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. A lot of times for musicians to want to bring it, bring commerce into it and Paul has not only done it for himself, but now with Rumblefish, he's doing it for thousands and thousands and thousands of independent artists. And it's amazing. Paul's got a great grasp on business and on life. And during this conversation, he said a lot of smart things, didn't he? He did. He said a lot of smart things, but there's that one thing, that one thing. Did you get it? Did you hear it? Let's do it. Let's find the hack. I'm very proud of what I've done and I simultaneously am very unimpressed by it because that's what an, being an entrepreneur is all about, right? It's moving forward. And that's the hack. Whoa, Paul. Yes. Thank you so much. I, this works so well because this is a brilliant answer to this question, this question about the entrepreneurial gap that I've been going really deep into and I'm going to continue to go very deep into, but he, Paul makes a really, really good point that I wanted to, I wanted to dive into a bit because it's true. I, t I talk about the gap and I talk about how we're always forward thinking and forward looking. That's, that's not the problem. I, I want to clarify that that isn't the problem and Paul gets it. The problem is that we don't also stop and look around and look behind us and at least congratulate ourselves or be humbled, as he says, by what he's accomplished. So he's got Paul's idea of an entrepreneur is the whole holding multiple scenarios in your head simultaneously, how he's both humbled by what he's accomplished and at the same time, unimpressed. And I think that's perfect. I think he understands the gap. You have to be, you have to appreciate what you've accomplished, no matter how small you might think that might be at this point, but also unimpressed because that's what's going to drive you forward. And that's just brilliant. And I just love it because it is, I'm going deep on this and I'm pushing it. I'm not pushing it because I'm not pushing the entrepreneurial gap because I think that we shouldn't 
as entrepreneurs be dreamers and push ahead and always throw loftier goals into the future. I think it's absolutely necessary and key for us to do that. But at the same time, I want us to stop. I want us to close that gap between the future and today and what we did. That's important. It's really, really important. And I'm not going to let up on this because I love where this question's always going with my guests. And just, Paul, you really summarized it really well and kind of brought it to, it was just really, really good. And I thank you, Paul, for that. And I thank you again for taking the time to stop by. That was an amazing, amazing conversation that I really, really, truly enjoyed. So we did it, guys. This was the first episode that I've recorded in another place. I'm in Vancouver. (laughs) If you're in Vancouver, you're going to be in Vancouver this summer. Hit me up, John at Hack the Entrepreneur. I'd love to meet. I've met several already listeners and I have quite a list of other ones I get to meet, have coffee with, have ice cream with, all different things. It's amazing. You guys are awesome. And I would love to hear from you. So I'll be here all summer. But uh, yeah, this was the first episode. It went a little bit longer, but that conversation with Paul was definitely, definitely worth it. If you haven't yet, I know there's so many of you out there and you haven't all done it yet. Go to the website, hacktheentrepreneur.com. You'll see my pretty face right there on the right. And just to the side of it, you'll place to put your email. Put your email in there. It's my newsletter. Once a week, that, that's what you're going to get from me. You'll get an email once a week written by me every Sunday afternoon. It's the best stuff I'm working on coming up with what I'm going through in my business and in my life and what I think will help you sort of push forward. And I would love to have you on there. Plus, it gives you access to me. You hit reply to even that first email or any email thereafter, and you have direct access to me and my inbox. Just do it. It'll be fun. Trust me. (laughs) All right, guys. Thank you so much. I really, truly do appreciate you stopping by to listen. And until next time, please keep hacking the entrepreneur. (laughs) 